Welcome to Tennessee Court Talk. I'm your host, Barbara Peck. This episode is intended for judges, lawyers, and policymakers. Today we are discussing the intersection between human trafficking and domestic violence. Our first guest is Judge Anna Escobar. She is a General Sessions judge in Davidson County and oversees the state's only human trafficking intervention court. Our second guest is Sarah Wolfson. She is an, an assistant district attorney in Davidson County who specializes in human trafficking cases. Our third guest is Judge Rob Filia. He's a juvenile judge in Hamilton County. And our fourth guest is Jerry Redman. He is the executive director of Street Grace in Chattanooga, an organization dedicated to ending the commercial sexual exploitation of children. Judge Escobar, when we think of human trafficking, I think our initial vision is often strangers and gangs kidnapping victims, forcibly holding them, and then selling them for sex. But how are domestic violence and human trafficking intertwined? Well, it's um, very interesting. Human trafficking relationships have so many components. And what I have realized is that um, domestic violence really plays a big part of it, so much so that a power and control wheel has been developed for human trafficking victims. So you have the same you know, intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation that you see in domestic violence but you also see um, the using of making the person who's being trafficked feel special, given privileges. So it's that whole power control wheel of um, abuse, but then the I'm sorry, and then a reward or a, you know, a gift. So it's very interesting. And a lot of these people in human trafficking actually are in relationships with their human trafficker. And they believe that, you know, that's, their true love and that the trafficker has their best interest at heart. Sarah, how are you seeing domestic violence and human trafficking coexisting? So especially if you're in a place where you have a specialized domestic violence Mm -hmm. court, oftentimes these cases will just run directly through as a domestic violence case because domestic violence with intimate partners, families, and oftentimes traffickers are or will present as the intimate partner of the victim, and oftentimes it is familial. So familial trafficking is a big thing as well. So a lot of the ways that uh, we're seeing these trafficking cases actually come through is that they're presenting as domestic violence cases. And with just a little bit more digging, um, it actually, they can be identified as not just intimate partners, but a trafficker and a victim. So Sarah, can you describe some of these situations where you have encountered human trafficking intertwined with domestic violence? Sure. First of all, I always like to say that the movie Taken with Liam Neeson is one of my least favorite films at this point, because that's just where, you know, this image of shackles and chains comes from. But a lot of the ways that I see these cases presented actually are because I've come in close contact with our domestic violence team at the DA's office. So oftentimes what we'll see is a victim will come in, and this is just one example that I have, 18 years old, the the defendant was 46 years old. She was pregnant by this 46-year-old defendant. Um, There were a couple of other elements. The the incident took place in a motel room. Um, There were just a couple of elements that said to the domestic violence ADA that this wasn't just a cut-and-dry DV issue, that there might be something more going on here. So they gave me a call. When I came down to interview the victim, it did, in fact, turn out that from the time that she was 16 years old, this defendant, who she was in court for a domestic violence incident with, had actually been trafficking her to other men. So oftentimes, just those simple relationships that you can look at and say, this was a DV case, you know, he hit her and and here we are, uh, just looking for some of those other red flags, that can actually be a human trafficking case. I would agree. The age difference has always been kind of a red flag for me, not that there's anything wrong with people falling in love with people with an age difference, but you can just tell that this couple doesn't really fit. Another thing um, that I've found interesting is in my the particular case I'm thinking of, the uh, victim referred to her tra- to the defendant as daddy, which I thought was interesting rather than sweetie or honey or, you know, something more loving. And also, they seem to live in houses um, full of people, and um, these people aren't related, so it's more of a a brothel, I guess, but, um, you know, for lack of a better word. But it's interesting when they can't explain where they work, where the trafficker works, um, and then they're in this house with people that they barely know. Judge Filia, what are you seeing in your juvenile courtroom? Well, 
we were talking earlier before we started about how sometimes it's hard to discern, hard to know, and many times the the teenagers will, of course, deny or, or make up stories as as the adult victims do, and make it hard to or harder to know uh, what's what's going on. I mean, they, we've we've got we've had situations here locally where it's it's obvious. Um, we had a, a young lady spend Christmas week four Christmases ago in the hospital and she'd been running and we knew she, we were afraid she was going to run again. So we kept somebody with her 24 hours a day for the first couple of days. And after, after a couple of days, she said, don't worry, I'm not going. And you know, that was a severe case because the, the doctor said, you know, she, she, the doctor actually said, I've never seen anything this bad. She'll never have children. And the infection was just so, so, so bad. Um, you know, and then, um, this year, we had a young teenage boy who was kidnapped from uh, a state three states away um, and is coming through Chattanooga. And luckily, we had an alert police officer who just didn't think something, you know, di didn't look right. Um, that young man denied uh, his identity, gave us a false ID, and didn't, did not want any part of, of help uh, at first. And, and then um, some the right folks, um, not very, not unlike some of Jerry's folks, but it wasn't Jerry's folks, but some the right folks talked to him, finally figured out who he was, what was happening, and then he broke down and said, I was told that, I've already been beaten up a couple of times, I was told I was being taken uh, to a southern state west of here to be raped. Uh, this was a young, young, young man. And so, and, and if not for that alert police officer and that alert intake officer, actually one of my staffers who who just said something's just not right here and kept asking the questions, uh, we wouldn't have figured that out. And, and the next day, the next morning, early, his mom was here uh, to pick him up and take him back. Uh, so, but, but, you know, those those are those two instances are extreme. More times than that, you know, it's, a, it's the, the teenage girl who runs and then when, when, when we get up, when we get her, you know, either she's arrested because there's been a runaway attachment out for her, whatever, um, and she's given a drug test and and she's positive for you know multiple uh, hard drugs that normal people just don't even abusers don't take together, mm -hmm. and you know you just you know that this 15 year old girl is not buying these drugs. Somebody's given them to her, and and that's that's you many more times than not. I guess what I'm trying to say is that's how we first get uh, a clue as to what's going on. So what are some of the unique complexities you see in relationships where human trafficking and domestic violence are intertwined, Sarah? So there's something called trauma bonding. And trauma bonding is what we see every single day working with these cases. And it's um, not unlike Stockholm Syndrome, where they kind of become connected to this person who has in some way preyed on their vulnerability in a way where they feel that the victim feels that she needs um, her trafficker. She needs this person. Um, this person has taken care of her. It's, it's a relationship very similar to domestic violence, and it is domestic violence in the sense that um, the trafficker will make the victim oftentimes feel very unworthy, and he will uh, or she will present as their savior. And I think that trauma bonding, one of the elements of trauma bonding is just the fact that we, you have somebody who's vulnerable and somebody who's preying on those vulnerabilities. And um, when that vulnerable person feels saved or cared for, they bond to that person. And then a second element of that is that if there is physical abuse involved or even emotional abuse involved, there's a gratefulness from the victim when the um, trafficker does not inflict that kind of pain. So it becomes this this vision of sort of, well, today he didn't beat me and I'm really grateful for that. Or today he bought me a really great dinner, so I'm really grateful for that. And, you know, he took care of me that way. Or he took me off the street and, yeah, he beat me all the time, but he also fed me. Um, so there's that big element of trauma bonding that, that's really, really strong and prevalent in these trafficking cases. And we see it a lot with adults, but we see it really a lot with juveniles. Um, Jerry, you obviously see these cases from a different perspective. What elements of coercion do you commonly see in these types of cases? Um, you know, the young, the young, the boys, the young men, the boys are, 
required to do certain things. The girls are required to do certain things, and it certainly qualifies as as human trafficking and sex abuse. Okay, but how does coercion look different in juvenile cases, Judge Escobar? Sadly, when your parent traffic is your trafficker, I think um, that just brings up a ton of issues. We recently had a young lady who whose mother was her trafficker and the one who introduced her to drugs. And she knew that if she was around her mother, she would, you know, um, use drugs. But she loved her mother, you know. So it's that whole dynamic. I mean, you still love your mother. You still want to be with her, especially I believe she was sick, wasn't she, Sarah? So she, she wanted to be her caretaker. So it's just a complex dynamic. Mm-hmm. Does, wait, okay, so does coercion always obviously look like coercion? There is a huge instance in most of the trafficking cases that I see right now. The two kind of biggest forms of coercion are either in a familial trafficking Mm -hmm. situation where uh, a juvenile or an adult, they are working for one of the parents um, to either help pay rent, help get mom drugs because mom is sick, that's one of the huge things that I see, and that is coercion. But I think kind of the biggest form of coercion that I see that is most shocking to people that it is considered coercion, but it is under the statute, is facilitation of drug abuse. So under our statute here in Tennessee for human trafficking, withholding drugs is a form of coercion. And I see that in almost all of my cases because drugs – as we all well know, um, have a very physical effect on the body. So withholding those drugs from somebody who is drug addicted and having that person go cold turkey, that severe illness um, is actually classified as coercion. So somebody saying, if you don't go out, I'm not going to be able to get us drugs or I'm not going to give you these drugs. That's a severe form of coercion for a man or woman who is addicted. Um, And that's something that under the trafficking statute we acknowledge as coercion, and it's something that I think is the most drastically different from what the general public sees as coercion. I think that this kind of scenario of the drug-addicted victim and the abusive trafficker, that's kind of the most unpalatable to the general public, but it's something that is, I think, the most prevalent. There was research that was released in early 2017 that reported of those cases in the U.S. of trafficking for 2016 that that were discovered. It was right at 40% of the identified traffickers were immediate family members. They didn't even speak to any poly victimizations such as domestic, domestic violence, so on and so forth. So then you add the drug element to that, and it, it mushrooms the amount of trauma inflicted on those particular victims. And as Sarah said, a lot of the general public is going to find this so un, not just unpalatable, but unbelievable that someone could ever do this. But I've said quite often, I may get in trouble for saying it here, but here in the South, and especially in our region of the South, sex within family systems in certain as, certain aspects of our region is known to be a, a multi, long-time generational thing. It's not even a full step to take what has gone on for generations within certain family systems and then make that commercial. I don't care what the drug is or whether it's about making sure the rent or the or food whatever it may be. Why are children particularly vulnerable to human trafficking? Again, I think our initial image of a juvenile human trafficking is a child kidnapped by a stranger and sold into slavery. But how does human trafficking intertwine with domestic violence look in a juvenile setting? Jerry? There's a famous chilling line from an expose that Anderson Cooper did on this a decade or more ago. A a social worker in Atlanta working very closely with this population said, if you're a dealer, you can only sell a dime bag once, but you can sell a 12-year-old over and over mm-hmm. again. That sounds almost like an oversimplification, but that's the reality of it. Yeah, and um, human trafficking is, is the second largest criminal enterprise behind drug trafficking, and it is climbing because exactly uh, for exactly that reason. If you sell drugs, that product is gone. 
but you sell a woman, she comes right back. And you sell her again, and she comes right back. So you never have to spend your money to re-up on a product. That product is there. So as much as I hate that because it's very dehumanizing, but it, it kind of is that that gang or enterprise mentality of human trafficking. Okay, let's talk about how we can better recognize these cases. What makes human trafficking cases that present with domestic violence particularly difficult to identify? The judge mentioned the power and control wheel. Children have neither. Again, maybe an oversimplification, but they, so, so it, they are low hanging fruit for those who are looking to exploit people for their own benefit. And the judge also mentioned the fact that oftentimes it's a family member, even a parent. And again, all of the general public may say, I don't understand how they could feel that way. Most kids love their parents in spite, in spite of what they've inflicted on them. I think that uh, prosecuting cases with juvenile victims is extremely challenging for a couple reasons. One is because juveniles are very prone to just running. Um, they, they don't really have interest in um, following along for a year or two long or two year long process that is prosecuting one of these cases. Um, but beyond that, um, the reason that juveniles are particularly vulnerable is because as a class, they are particularly vulnerable. You think about how long it takes us to kind of build up our confidence as people. Well, juveniles, especially the ones that are most susceptible to trafficking, typically don't have stable family units. They're runaways. They might be truant. They might engage in criminal activity themselves. So in terms of prosecuting these cases with juveniles as victims, where am I, where are we as a society putting these juveniles so that they can receive the services that they need to build themselves up enough to confront the fact that, that they were in fact trafficked. That's number one. Oftentimes juveniles don't even want to identify that way. Um, but number two, how are we fixing this cycle for them where this instability, this instability that they, that they have um, is kind of tamed enough for them to go through the traumatic process of, prosecuting their traffickers so with adults it's it's similar but with adults you have a situation where they are able to find housing they're able to go out and and um, get kind of broad services because they are adults whereas juveniles are reliant on somebody else to help them with that somebody else to do that for them Juveniles have to be placed somewhere. They have to be placed in housing. If they have parents that are active in their life, we as a state can't, without good reason, take them away unless, like I said, there's a good reason. So again, we're in this situation with juvenile victims where getting them to cooperate with a process like prosecution involves them having stability and getting that stability for a juvenile is extremely challenging. Okay, so we've identified that children are increasingly vulnerable in these hit situations. Judge Filia, what are the biggest obstacles that you're facing in reaching a good outcome when you start to suspect a defendant in your courtroom may be a victim of human trafficking? Tennessee, much like a lot of states, lacks uh, lack enough enough services to to effectively do that um, unfortunately number of beds for these type of victims uh, is very 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 few in fact we were talking earlier about how hard it is to to place a a juvenile victim who is also suffering from maybe drug addiction and 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 other things and needs re real rehabilitative help and we as a state don't have a whole lot to uh, to offer them, you know, it, juveniles. We know, we know, juvenile brains are not fully developed. And in picking up on the uh, the earlier conversation, we know that brains, you know, are frontal lobe, particularly decision making, logic, that those sorts of things. Don't the brain's not fully developed until mid twenties? You know, the numbers, different studies say different things, a little bit different for males and females. But we're talking about fifteen year olds, sixteen year olds here who are vulnerable already for so many so many reasons and when you throw in you know, maybe poverty or dependency and neglect from their from their parents you know that makes them even more uh, susceptible but also 15 16 17 year olds who are out using drugs sometimes don't even realize that they're being used that they're being trafficked in. and uh, and and you know they the perception that their abuser tries to paint and and I think sometimes they buy into it is that it's a big old party. 
and uh, so so that just really adds to the the issue with the already immature, already very vulnerable uh, juvenile victims. And just one more thing to add to with this is that the complexity of the trauma that comes from specifically trafficking as opposed to some other types of trauma, um, I think that we need special services to address. And that's something that as a state, we are kind of at the forefront of specifically for adults. We do very well in addressing um, the complex wraparound trauma that we need for adults. But for juveniles, like I said, it's a little bit harder to tap into, but it's not simply, I, in my personal opinion, at least, simple therapy might not address kind of the the layers of trauma that human trafficking specifically can inflict on anybody, but particularly a juvenile. So it's that very complex trauma that makes it challenging to address these cases with juveniles. And what about outside organizations? If the state cannot do everything from identifying victims to prosecuting defendants to helping find wraparound services, what are some of the ways like nonprofits like yours, Jerry, can help? I'm, first of all, an apologist for the state because I speak to a lot of audiences where during the Q&A I get these questions. Well, what are our judges, our prosecutors, our law enforcement? It's like, what are they doing all the way to the White House? And I, my answer is typically everything they can with the very limited resource base that, that they have. I always turn it around to the community Becca Stevens, the founder of Thistle Farms in Nashville, has a great statement. This problem is created at the community level. It therefore should be incumbent primarily on the community to solve it. And I've just always been a big believer in that. One of the things that we've always done as, as an organization is come alongside those, those local, state, and, and federal partners, some of whom have sought us out. But our question has always been, how can we help you? If, if my organization is going to be of any help to this population, I need to be making sure I'm just as much of a help to those local, state, federal agencies that are providing service. But none of these issues, and this larger issue as a meta issue, will be solved if we, the community, are not willing to spend the money necessary to address it. And I find quite often that the conversation goes in a different direction or stops with the community when I start talking about the dollars that are needed. Tennessee, from, from a legislative standpoint, our legislature ha is quite engaged and has been quite generous in the monies that they have been willing to put forward in this. But, that's, but they don't have enough money to take care of the residential needs alone. If all we're talking about is beds, before we even get into therapy, it's uh, educational needs, et cetera, just what it's going to take to safely house kids, the private sector, that's their, sp at least their, that should be their space. And that's, an, that's a, a space where if they would be willing to step in, partnering with us, through us, so that we can link arms with, with our governmental partners, we could begin to see a turning of the tide. And as Sarah's already intimated the fact that we've got so much in place for adult victims. We are lagging, though, however, in serving our children and youth who've been victimized in this way. Wow, excellent point. Our nonprofit partners are so, so important. But what can judges better do to recognize human trafficking cases? What questions should they be asking, Judge Escobar? Well, I will say, uh, I've been in the domestic violence field for about seven years now, and I've had a crash course in human trafficking once I took over this court. And once you have that mindset, I don't know if you experienced this, Judge, you're always like, ooh, that person could potentially be a victim. Um, so what I was going to talk to the judges about is that you just, you get this sense, like you were talking, Judge, where, you know, you start hearing a victim testify and then you figure out wait a minute the, the, the location of the arrest was in a hotel motel you know massage parlor they've got branding um, we had a young lady go through our program that had her traffickers tattoo on her neck um, so it can be that obvious um, 
you know, like I said before, pe multiple people who aren't related living in houses, um, that age gap. Um, and even though they present at, as a domestic violence couple, there's not that love or intimacy that you see in most couples, even if they're fighting. Um, you can tell when they have been told what to say in court. You can tell that they are disconnected from family and friends and seem to only rely on this uh, trafficker. Um, and, you know, what has made me pause sometimes is the way these um, ladies most often show up in court. I had a young lady come in basically a little house on the prairie type dress. Like it was so ridiculously staged she you know a high collar like so proper but you could tell she was uncomfortable in those clothes it was like an act you know and so there are different things that judges can do um, I oftentimes will stop and say something to the defense attorney and the and the prosecutor and say hey have y'all talked to this person are they safe what can we do can we offer them numbers but honestly a lot of times they will not admit right there because the trafficker is sitting right there but my hope is that if if they see that others see that they're in this situation and are given phone numbers given resources that someday along the line we have planted a seed where they can reach out we're really all about planting the seed yeah. um in domestic violence relationships it takes seven times i believe to leave your abuser and i want to say it's probably more with trafficking i don't have the exact statistic in front of me but i mean to get like we started out this podcast with, it's not a hooray, thank you for rescuing me situation, almost none of the time. So really what kind of we're set out to do is plant a seed. That's what we do in our trafficking intervention court. We don't expect every woman to come through this court to be successful the first time that she comes. And in fact, most of the time they are not. Yes. Uh, but what we do see is that if we can have a conversation, whether it's with a victim who comes through the domestic violence court, if we can say to them, look, I see this. And even if they're going to sit there and deny it, if we say we see it and, and here's who you can call if you want to, um, we do see these women back two years later, even mm -hmm. three years later, they'll come back um, most had, of the time. Yeah, we've had ladies terminated from our program who two, three years later come back through the criminal justice system and want to come back to us. And now they're ready for the help. And that is wonderful, honestly. So we always tell them, even when when I have to terminate them, look, you know, we're here. Whenever you're ready, we're here. Um, but it is heartbreaking, heartbreaking when you when you see that people aren't ready. But it's not about me. It's about them and their journey, and we got to respect that. Um. So let's switch to the prosecution end. What makes human trafficking cases that present with domestic violence particularly difficult to prosecute, and how do you overcome those challenges? The biggest challenges are, of course, the the subset of victims that we're working with. I think human trafficking victims are some of the most vulnerable that uh, we deal with in the criminal justice system for so many reasons, like I spoke about before, just the layers of trauma. But in addition to that, what makes these hard to prosecute as well uh, is the community's understanding of what human trafficking looks like. So if I take a case to a jury trial, which quite frankly, uh, I have not taken a human trafficking case to a jury trial they take a very long time uh, to prepare, but say that I, I do and I'm picking a jury, well, uh, I want jurors who understand that drugs can be used as coercion. I want jurors who understand that this victim had access to a cell phone the entire time that she was with her trafficker. I want jurors who understand that, yes, she walked away from her trafficker, went into a gas station, ran into a hotel clerk, and didn't say anything. And I want those jurors to understand that she was still being trafficked. And right now, with the community's understanding, and I think that we're making strides uh, we in our education for the community on what trafficking is, but it's really, really important that we continue that education because for me to prosecute these cases, I need a community that understands what these cases look like. And I, I hope that we're there. I don't know if we're there yet, but if we are not there, hopefully we get there. And that's just one of the big barriers that I see, just aside from the class of victims, like I said, which is, of course, that, that first jump is even getting a victim on board or getting enough um, evidence surrounding uh, that 
incident that I don't need the victim. Huge barrier. Second huge barrier is just education. And I'm sure the trafficker knows everything mm-hmm. about the victim. So he, he or she would know their mental health yes. issues, you know, their addiction issues, whatever issues that can use be used to discredit. Another thing is when you speak to people, I'm sure you all have found this in the community about human trafficking, they they think Thailand or, you know, somewhere across, you know. Or the, the, uh, yeah. the, the lady chained to the hot water. Right, 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 right. So it's it's hard, and I think you had a graph where how many U.S. citizens mm-hmm. were actually yeah it's it's our citizenship of referrals. This came from end slavery. Um, out of two hundred, I suppose in twenty eighteen, one hundred and ninety one of those were U.S. citizens. So I think the the perception that it's all kind of a, a foreign or abroad issue is a big thing, and it's just kind of not not the truth here. Um, and another kind of Uh, big thing is exactly what judge said about credibility. So even if I do have a victim who's on board, putting that person on the stand to testify is not only extremely traumatic, but oftentimes they present to a jury as not the most credible witness. Why? Because they have mental health issues. They're drug addicted. They've committed crimes. They have a long criminal history. Um, They, you know, may have, done some things that in their life that people would look at and say, well, you got yourself into this situation. But of course, that is not the truth. Uh, These women who have been trafficked have experienced trauma that probably started when they were young. They deserve for us to believe their story. They deserve for us to respect their story. And I think that's another huge barrier is just that, that perception of what a victim looks like. Another issue I think you have found is that they're on a circuit. Um, So they're not in Nashville or Chattanooga, you know, for a year or two, they're there for two weeks and then they get changed out into the circuit. So it's very hard to find them. Yeah. Yeah. Leaving, making sure that they're disoriented and somewhat off their game is, is certainly something that we have seen. We have also seen where familial trafficking is concerned that the if especially if it is a family member or a child who is of majority they are actually allowed some level of autonomy in their lives but then it, it goes back to the trauma the trauma bonding and whatnot so they may even be left alone for a week two weeks or so but then the text or the call comes and that person has to decide what the cost of compliance is versus the cost of non-compliance. Either way, there is a, a cost. And we've had many survivors talk to us over the years as to what went into their decision-making as to when, when they would show up where we were supposed to show up and what would cause them every now and then to, to not and then bear the cost of it later. I'll add one other thing. It's already been mentioned here. I think the Taken movie has already been referenced. <laughs> and, what, and, and I, you know, God bless Liam Neeson. At least it got some of the conversation started back in the day. I, I heard from friends say, hey, I saw that movie about that thing you do. And then I finally went to see the movie and I thought, well, I don't do any of that. I, tying somebody to a chair and electrocuting them is not really in our uh, policies and procedures. But it, it was a great conversation starter. What I continue to run into out in the community are the, the folks who they, they are willing to accept the surprising data around the fact that most of our victims are U.S. born and U.S. citizens. That they're, even, uh, they're even willing to accept the surprising data that trafficking is local. But it's still, they talk to me about, well, I have heard I shouldn't go to certain places. I shouldn't go to certain stores because they'll snatch me out of the parking. I swear to God, I heard this last week. I was working out, and a workout friend said, oh, you know, I've heard about that thing you do, Jerry. Good on you, whatnot. And I've been told I shouldn't go to such – I won't say it here, such, but you hear it all the time, Judge <laughs> Phil, y'all. I shouldn't go to such and such place to shop because they'll snatch you there. I'm like, no, man, you shouldn't go to such and such place to shop just because it's weird over there. <laughs> but <laughs> it's more likely that somebody you already know is going to do that to you. I – Before coming here, I spoke to a group at lunch. One of the people that came up to me after to thank me for coming, they spun this crazy story that grew legs on the Internet about three years ago about these high-powered, high-level individuals that are running very sophisticated trafficking operations out of 
storefronts and whatnot. And I just had to sit there and gently try to redirect them into how it most likely is going to look. I know that trafficking can happen to anyone, by anyone, anywhere. But if this is the fastest growing organized crime in the world, and it, and it is, our response should be just as organized, therefore should be just as intelligent and informed as those who are perpetrating the crime because they are informed, they are intelligent, and they are organized. So tell me about what Streetwise does on the prosecution end, not just providing the services part. Your goal is to end sexual exploitation of children. What are you doing, and how are you helping to collect evidence and help prosecutors? We have, for instance, a, a bot program that we use, and, and, and I will say that I can't go too far down the, the road of discussing technology because I, I'm not well-versed there, but the bot Gracie has been developed by some partners of ours. It right now is having conversations in various states around the country, including Tennessee, posing as a 15-year-old white, black, Latina, Asian female, as well as a 15-year-old boy. Gracie can negotiate services, rates, locations, and times. And then at whatever point the potential buyer agrees on the service, the rate, and the place, then Gracie sends a, another text message. And this is all run through fake ads that have been set up on sites where people looking to buy sex with kids are, are known to frequent. A text is then sent to let the potential buyer know, here's actually what's been going on. You, you've been negotiating the rape of a child and your contact info has been cataloged and has now been passed along to both local, to the local state and federal law enforcement based on where you are. Oh, by the way, though, here is, here is a list of services in your local area for folks that have the issue that you have of being drawn to sexual relationships with children. Some 100,000 um, individual text conversations since last year through that, that tool, and about 15% of those who are negotiating to buy sex with a child have at least clicked on the first link of the services that could help them regarding their their issue. So once you're providing services to victims, what types of services are available around the state and why is this so important, Sarah? Uh, well, like I said, prosecuting a human trafficking case is extremely complex. They, For me to prosecute a human trafficking case can take up to two years um, just to gather all the evidence that I need in order to take that to trial. Um, so the importance of getting wraparound services is that, first of all, it gives this victim time to build up their confidence, their self-esteem, to address the trauma, um, and to hopefully be in a place where by the time they have to confront their trafficker, if they do, um, they feel kind of more stable than they they were. Um, but, of course, the other really important part about getting wraparound services as it relates to prosecution is that without those wraparound services, this person is still so vulnerable. And with that vulnerability means that this person is probably not going to stick around. Somebody else is going to prey on that vulnerability. We can keep her trafficker in custody, but there's another one out there. And if this person, this man or woman who's been trafficked doesn't receive the kind of services that he or she needs to kind of build them up and show them that there's community, there's love, there's safety, and all of that, well, they're back in the same position that they started in. So in terms of just keeping a victim around, keeping a victim safe, um, and keeping a victim available, getting those kind of wraparound services and getting that treatment is the most important thing that we can do. What I love about our court is that some of our partners not only address the trauma, the addiction, and, and those things, but also help the person get the skill. Um, with um, In Slavery, Tennessee, there's a program, Strings of Hope, where the ladies um, are able to make jewelry and sell it through their program. And, of course, uh, Thistle Farms um, has both a cafe, and I invite all, all of you to come That's and eat great. at the cafe. That's it's great. amazing. You feel so good after you've left there. And then they're wonderful products. Um, we have a participant in our court who just started the candle-making 
part of the of the training and so she's very excited to be back at work knowing that she can put that on her resume and and gain some skills and she could stay at Thistle Farms if if she'd like. Um, so I think giving them that not only the love and support that they need but tools to you know get out there and start their next chapter of their lives. We've got great examples of solid high-level collaborative services available for survivors in the state. The judges has mentioned a few of them. For instance, the, the organization here in Chattanooga Home and Havens, we work very closely with. They help survivors get set up in, in their own apartment as far as helping with the furnishing of it and whatnot. What we don't have is enough of that. And we certainly don't have enough, be they adult victims or minor victims, we just simply don't have enough residential services. And that's that's possibly our greatest need is take what we have, which is done, being done very well, expand it, but certainly pon, uh, exponentially expand the number of beds that we have available for this type of victim. Thank you everyone for joining us on this great discussion about the intersection between human trafficking and domestic violence on this edition of Tennessee Court Talk. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you.